Um, so biotech. Biotech has had a bit of a rough year. There have been layoffs and closures, reduced number of IPOs and venture capital investment. And you, in your annual letter, spoke about the poly crisis, other headwinds that we were facing. Um, but you also spoke about something you called paranoid optimism. Um, I think I get the paranoid part. Um, where does the optimism come from? <laughs> well, first, thanks for having me. Um, like, I think optimism is about belief in a better future. And I think we're all in, in, innately optimistic. It's just that the reality causes us to question it. And that's where the paranoia comes in. So I think nobody doing science, nobody doing any kind of discovery or creative work uh, isn't propelled somewhat by optimism because they're trying to make something better. A doctor is trying to make something better. What motivates them to do that? You could say impact, but the beginning of the, the, the impulse is just an optimism that they can do it. Uh, so I think that those two elements, mindsets of paranoia and optimism, when married, allow you to cautiously explore novelty, which is kind of what science is and what biotechnology is. So I've long viewed that mindset to be crucial. And of course, you know, periods of time, economic difficulties, other difficulties make it easier or harder to do this. But in both of those times, you have to have both paranoia and, and, and optimism. It's a gas pedal and a brake pedal. And then you get the steering wheel. But ultimately, if you don't have those two devices, you're going to be reckless. So you have, um, I think, 44 companies and scientists exploring many, many more targets and molecular pathways as possibilities. And I wonder, what, what, are your, uh, what are the ones that you are the most optimistic about? Could you give us your top one, two, three um, what ifs, as I think you mm -hmm. like to call them? Well, that's, that's an impossible task for me, because as soon as I say that, all, of them? all, all, the, all <laughs> the other ones will, will immediately conclude that they did something wrong. And so the reality is that the, we have the, the luxury or the, or the kind of lunacy of working on totally unprecedented things, which by at birth could be transformative if only they could be real. And so every one of them is a journey to figure out how real it can be, how scalable it can be, and can it become that in an affordable timeline and cost? And we are, in a way, in the disappointment business because we go in assuming that we can do that and we put a lot of resources and resourcefulness into the task and a lot of adaptation along the way to kind of change direction, try to figure it out. And if we succeed, it, it hopefully becomes a big deal. An extreme example of that, at least in the last few years, has been Moderna in the sense that it was the result of 10 years of platform development, which then seemed like an overnight success when the pandemic hit. But the reality is there was two and a half billion dollars in 10 years of work that went into it. All of our other companies have similar journeys of trying to establish totally new platforms. And so it's hard in the beginning, I, I could describe any one of these in a way that could be a big deal, if only, there's, there's a cartoon, by the way, that I used to use a long time ago that once in a while I pull out which is just imagine you know, these two people in the sand in the desert, and they have found a tiny little kind of uh, uh, um, pyramid-looking thing. And then somebody goes, this might be the find of the century, depending on how far down it goes, right? Because otherwise, it could just be a little pyramid of nothing else. So that mindset I've always found to be the mindset of an entrepreneur. You have to assume it goes way down, but you have to be prepared for the fact that it doesn't. Well, you mentioned Moderna. Does does the success of Moderna and the place you're in now, which was different than it, perhaps it was a few years ago, has it changed at all the way you think about, say, um, your risk tolerance or the scale at which you want to approach things? Well, I, I would say that, so Moderna, before COVID hit, had 22 products in clinical development. It now has 50. 22 products was, was significantly larger than pretty much any biotech company in that stage of development. So, you know, one, we won't know what would have happened without the pandemic. We would have certainly not had quite the resources and we wouldn't have had to be able to go as quickly, but also we wouldn't have been able to enter into hundreds of millions of humans. So one of the things that flipped there was that you took a technology that had not been in humans, but for a few hundred people we had tested it on previously to now having hundreds of millions. So if you want to think about safety and, and, and how to think about expanding the range of applications. So, that changed. How does that affect how we think about it? I don't know that our risk tolerance has increased or decreased. Our awareness of all the things that 
can impact success. For example, scale, just how do you scale that quickly? How do you go from 500 people to 6,000 people in a couple of years? Those are unique, unique challenges of that particular journey. But there are other things that we've learned from Moderna that are benefiting a lot of our other companies. So for example, Moderna was very early in doing strategic partnerships. And we observed that closely and we thought it's unique to them. Today, much of the time I spend uh, on, on helping our companies is all about making strategic partnership with large pharma companies because what I've concluded is that in the end, a platform to become a real a kind of a long-term success, you need to be linked to the incumbents in the field. And so we're prioritizing that. And we got a lot of that learning from the experience with Moderna. So one of the, um, uh, I think a couple of strategic partnerships uh, involve Nova Nordisk, the maker of, say it with me, Ozempic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's a very different kind of company than your startups. It's, it's a much older, um, much, it's a European company owned by a foundation. It has a very Danish culture. Uh, how do you make relationships like that work between startups that need to stay nimble, but working with um, the established big pharmas yeah. that have a different way of doing business and maybe take longer? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, no Novo is a company that, that anybody in this field has known for a long time and, and, and you know, very Danish is a, an advantage or a disadvantage, depending on how well they do. Turns out these days it's an advantage. And so I would say that one of the things you learn um, in, in doing startups is you really have to understand the ecosystem you're working in. And inevitably, a company like Novo has been a long-term oriented, kind of dominant in knowing about diseases in diabetes, metabolic disease. And there's no substitute for that level of of, of knowledge of the unmet needs and approaches and staying power. I mean, the fact that they're owned by a foundation or a holding company, the fact that they have this 100-year commitment to this disease has its advantages, which is that if there is something that it takes 17 tries to get to work, they'll be there at the 17th. Most people give up after the third, let alone if they have quarterly reports to investors that kind of say, well, this isn't working, you should move on and do another disease. So I, I obviously have great respect for them. And, and I think that in, a, in an interesting way, I think of what we do as a form of kind of scientific insurgency. I think what they do is incumbency. And these two things, rather than being at odds, are actually quite complementary if they can work together because an incumbent ultimately relies on insurgents to take the kind of risks that they cannot take quite as early. And yet insurgents often think about replacing the incumbent as their objective. And in many ways, there's, if you build enough value, there's ways to share that value and continue to be an insurgent in lots of other directions. And that's kind of how we view our role, is that we think what we've built at Flagship is a network of insurgents, each of them trying to take on some unprecedented thing. If they happen to succeed, then now they are showered with massive challenges of scale and, and, and resourcing, et cetera. And those are the things where the partnerships can begin to make sense. So we're, we're experimenting, we're learning, but I think that's more compatible than you might think. What is less compatible is a slight variation of what already exists, which a startup wants to bring forward, which the large company might as well do themselves because it's not that big a departure. Those relationships tend to be more transactional as opposed to interactions, where we like interactions that can kind of transcend one or two years and really start sharing knowledge and sharing success. Well, how do you make those interactions happen? Do you have teams from the US startup that embed in, in uh, Denmark or vice versa? Uh, is it just a lot of Zoom calls? How does that, how yeah. do, how, how, walk us through well, like, how do those relationships really get built? Well, so in, in, in this case, I guess maybe um, I'll, I'll be more specific. We started three, four years ago internal to Flagship. Flagship's known for building platform companies, platforms in the biotech space are new modalities like mRNA, new uh, technologies, or for that matter, a new piece of biology that once you develop mastery in, can create many products. That's what I mean by platform. It's one common investment, many products. So one consequence of that is that you're not gonna develop all the products you can actually conceive because it just takes a lot of money and a lot of time to do this in our space. So you now have an excess of potential inventory. It's not real yet, just because you have no, so you need a way to get it out to have impact. So the relationships that we forged first were preceded by flagship realizing we better have our own internal capability to develop drugs. And we started a program about four years ago called Pioneering Medicines, and that's now grown to almost 100 people. These are all experts in drug development in different disease areas that joined us with a view towards taking individual programs and advancing them to human clinical trials. 
Once we did that, that entity looked much more recognizable to Innovo, to a Pfizer, to others, than our platforms do, which look like kind of novel foreign objects that kind of like, we don't know if it's gonna work. And it's those teams that have forged these relationships. So they're very collegial, very much about aligning around what a target product profile would be that we could aim for. Then we bring in some new platform capabilities to enable that. We have a bunch of stage gates along the way. And if things progress through stage gates, through shared risk, shared rewards, we advance them into clinical development. It's a, I, you know, it, this might be shocking to, a, to an audience uh, that may not use the following words that I'm going to say, so brace yourself. But I view what we're trying to establish as a notion of innovation supply chains. So supply chains are thought of as manufacturing conceptions. But actually, I think the pharmaceutical industry is just as much about creating impact from innovation than any other industry. And yet, they don't think about often where are they getting these innovations. They understand where they can buy products in licensing. But thinking about innovation supply chains, saying how do we line up some upstream contributors of capabilities and inventions that feed into our production plans and our pipeline. That type of supply chain, the mutualism that's involved when an end manufacturer relies upon the innovations of its suppliers, we don't see that a lot in our industry. And we're believers that if this is gonna be a long-term uh, uh, game, you really need to forge these relationships. So, that's kind of what we're playing with, is this notion of innovation supply chains. Do you need to invest in and start those supply chain partners yourself, or can you partner with outsiders? Well, we are wanting to establish these supply chains between our innovations and the pharma companies as the equivalent of a car manufacturer. In other words, the downstream or the apple of the world that relies upon innovations upstream, the pharma industry is that for the way we're thinking about it. And once in a while, like in Moderna, we will create a pharma company. But other times, we could create a lot of return on that early risk if we can forge these alliances. And again, I'm not saying this is a panacea. It's a lot of hard work. And people's, you know, an incumbent can shift directions quickly, depending on what the company is. And if you're a supplier to that incumbent, and all of a sudden what you're working on is irrelevant, that's a dangerous place to be. So you can't rely, over-rely on this. Capital markets and these kind of partnerships end up balancing each other. You mentioned in the beginning of our discussion it's been a tough capital environment for many startups, let alone in life sciences, where the time horizons are long. I don't know what other antidote there is to that other than finding capital and support in complementary sources so that you have the two things to rely on and not just how capital markets feel about your industry. Well, you've had a number of successes, Moderna, as we've discussed, but there have been some failures as well. We've had uh, recently Excella Health and Evolo Therapeutics, just for instance, you know, shuttered. Mm -hmm. So what lessons do you learn from the failures? I mean, we learn most of the lessons through failures, but you have to understand, for us, and again, I've been doing this for 35, 36 years, I don't think I would have done it unless I viewed things this way. So I'll tell you how I make peace with that. I view breakthroughs as an emergent thing. I don't view them as being made by people. I, work, I view them as being emergent. So what does emergence mean? The thing we know most about emergence is evolution. So Darwinian evolution, natural selection, applied to variation, that's an emergent process. And so what I mean by that is that I view what we do as create a lot of variation, apply a lot of selection pressure, and then iterate, 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 iterate. Eventually, under resource constraints, some of those things will fail. Some of these species will die out. And you can learn a lot along the way, but if you're not willing to suffer those failures and actually run the experiments, you cannot have the successes. So to me, a successful species is the descendant of a whole lot of species that went extinct in an indirect way because they were in the same competition. And so I, I very much think that while it's super important to learn from these things, you have to realize that if you're not meeting enough failures, you're not going to have any successes. And so we view it in a fairly objective way. Now, how you approach it, obviously, it impacts people and, and careers and the like. Given our size and scale, we, we, we do our best to make sure that that process is institutionally supported versus an individual startup where if you fail, you shut off the lights and that's it. So we have a long history of being able to help people. We, a lot of people in our companies actually get redirected into other companies. We have 40 some companies. And so I think there's, there's ways to do that. And, and I don't want to and I kind of dismiss the human impact, but, but, but that it is a necessary part of creating breakthroughs. I don't know how to create breakthroughs otherwise. So the Neanderthals and the humans, they continue to have 
a relationship for a bit until the humans can benefit in the long run. And then people will sequence the humans and find a lot of Neanderthal. A lot of Neanderthal, yep. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Um, so one area that's attracted a lot of uh, attention and money is longevity, and uh, that's a broad category that means not just, I think, to people expanding the lifespan, but what c people call the health span and wellness. What is Flagship's ambition in that space? We have, for the last few years, been working on what we call preemptive health and medicine. This precedes the pandemic, although the pandemic kind of took over this topic, and that is, can we, th with just the observation that uh, the many now have made, uh, that you know, what we call healthcare is a euphemism, it's actually sick care. And you, you know it pretty easily because you have to get sick to get any of it. And so very little of healthcare is dispensed before you're sick. So the question is, if you started over again and you actually want to dispense healthcare, what would that look like? And we think about prevention, so clearly we have vaccines to do prevention. But the more we've learned about disease, the more I think we can find traces of the early phases of disease that one could easily call pre-disease. There's such a thing as pre-diabetes. When you get a colonoscopy, you're looking for often polyps. Is that a cancer? Not necessarily. Is that a pre-disease of cancer? Absolutely. So you want to do something about it. Why don't we as a society spend money actually trying to detect pre-disease and pre-patients and pre-treat it so as to delay the disease? That was what we mean by preemptive health and, 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 and medicine. So perhaps health span more than lifespan. Health span for sure. Health span maximization for sure. And, and I just think, so one, one interesting statistic, in the UK where they trace these things, we looked a couple of years ago, two and a half percent of their healthcare cost goes upstream of disease. So two and a half cents in upstream, the rest downstream. Imagine if our military operated that way. So we basically spend 99% of our, of our money in war and 1% to avoid, prevent, delay war. We figured that out as a society a long time ago and we said, you know what, how about we put in 10, 20% and more upstream of that and then reserve these really expensive weapons when we really need them. That same mindset in health is complicated by our insurance system, our regulatory system, and so on. But if I said today, are we really gonna provide healthcare the same way 50 years from now? Most people say, no, 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 by then, we'll be able to see very early signs of disease. And for example, in cancer, where we're working, a company called Harbinger we have, is not only looking for cancer and circulating blood, but we're looking for stage one and stage zero cancer. There's no other manifestation, but for the fact that if you wait six months or a year, you'll actually get a diagnosis. If we can get to that early stage, then pharma companies will be able to try agents of that subset of people. I'm very optimistic to your words, but I'm also very paranoid that there's a hell of a lot of things that will get in the way. Still, the prize is worth the struggle, and I think we're definitely working on that. We've got many companies that are chasing that. So we want to get to the audience questions, and usually I try to give folks a little bit of a warning, but we're running low on time, so I'm just gonna go straight to the questions if we can um, bring the lights down. There are mics around the room, There's and if people raise their hand, I can call on you and get a, a mic to you. Um, um, this gentleman here on the side, I think you were, you were first. <laughs> I'll try to be brief. Please, um, please introduce yourself, if sure. you would. Peter Berkronos, Inception Property Group. We own, manage, develop healthcare facilities. I like your comment about the innovation supply chain. Uh, I'd like to say or ask, what is the gap in the human capital supply chain to serve the innovation supply chain, i.e., what are universities and people studying life science, what should they be aiming or targeting for to uh, best fulfill that innovation supply chain for Moderna and, and your, your competitors? Yeah, that's Thanks. a great, great question. I mean, there's a lot of different answers I can give you, but in short, I'd say first, it's really important for people to realize that when you work in this industry, you're basically, by definition, having social impact in that you're dealing with people's health and their lives. It's an extremely rewarding industry to be in if you are mission-oriented. Second, you wanna give people not only tools for the present way in which it works, but for the future. And by definition, that means we believe a heavy emphasis on being able to be f familiar and able to use AI approaches across the board. This is an inevitable, irreversible trend that's affect affecting our industry. So, and you know, places like Northeastern University, for example, where they've had a long standing record of getting students embedded, we have tons of, uh, co our companies use a lot of these interns. So how to get people exposed, infected, with the potential of working in this space and then how do you enable them to be able to learn how to grow and how to learn. These are all things that I think many great schools are doing today. 
Do we have other questions? It's a little hard for me to see. Um, I see a hand up over there in the back. Uh, Dr. Argata Green, uh, Thoracic Surgery, Cleveland Clinic, uh, Florida. Uh, you talked about uh, preventing or, or detecting early stage cancer. Number one killer uh, in cancer is lung cancer. Do you have any initiatives uh, regarding detecting early pre-cancer lesions and like CT scanning and, you know? So our approach there is there's a company called Harbinger Health where internally we developed a, an epigenetic set of markers that unlike our other approaches where these are purely statistically derived by looking at lots of cancer patients, in our case, these are biologically derived. In other words, these indicate a particular pathway that gets turned on in most cancers, lung cancers included. And so we are essentially developing tests that we could use as a screen for very early stage detection of any number of cancers in circulating blood with the capability to then figure out what the tissue of origin is, which is a different type of test. So the combination of the two, we think, will precede CT scans and other approaches because you might say, what am I going to do with a stage zero cancer? And the other is to essentially carefully watch and use other techniques only on those people to be able to detect as early as possible a physical manifestation of it. So that's our approach. I'm sure there's many other ones. We have time for one more question, if you promise to be super fast. And I see a gentleman here who I think would like to ask one. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I'm a fast Jonathan. answer. I'm Jonathan Smiga, uh, King Growth Capital. We're impact investors in health and wellness. Uh, you know, when I listen to the, the things today, right, we had the Ozempic piece. They made Nord, uh, Nova Nordic massive amounts of money. Eli Lilly's doubled its market cap in the last couple of years. We listened to the last panel all about treatments. How do you, and I love what you've been saying about, you know, stage zero cancer. My wife's a breast cancer survivor in that regard. Um, but how do we move the pathways of follow the health or follow the money? Seems to be you know, inconsistent motives in the broader healthcare industry where there's tons of money to be made for post-cancer treatments, as an example, rather than what you're talking about, how do we do more genetic testing, cellular mutation testing, things that give us a chance to actually nip it at the bud. And we're, we're low on time, yeah, so exactly. we'll have to. So I don't have a one answer, one word answer for that, but I would say uh, much of the money, as you know, in healthcare is spent on things that don't work, uh, but it is lost in the, in the kind of system and then new things often will get a lot of scrutiny because people try to recover some value for what they've put in and the risk they've taken. And I just think that the innovators have to do a much better job of describing the impact they're having, the cost justification for what they're charging, and the rest of the industry has to be able to explain why so much waste happens and so much of the money is lost in intermediaries. So I don't have a good fix to that, but I do think that it is a political issue just as much as it's a economic or scientific issue. 